Hello, everyone. I'm Walter Brennan from EXP, and welcome back to the TEA's Theme Park Design Series. Uh, before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items for you. Uh, number one, this session is being recorded, so uh, you've been warned. Number two, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to jot them down in the chat window of your Zoom uh, opportunity there, and we will get to those at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the intent and the purpose of this series is to shine a spotlight on some of the disciplines in the themed entertainment industry that may not be as well known or as well understood. And the idea is to give students and veteran TEA members alike the opportunity to find out more about some of these disciplines. Um, so basically, it's like pulling the curtain back a little bit and seeing some of the magic behind the scenes. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the fourth installment of our series. Uh, in the first installment, we talked about landscape architecture and how that is actually the first opportunity that guests get to uh, see a new attraction as they approach it. And therefore it's a perfect opportunity to start telling the story of that attraction. Um, in our second installment, we talked about architecture and how the architect is actually the master builder. Uh, they are responsible for coordination of everybody's uh, different disciplines uh, but then they also have their own, uh, whether it's life safety or accessibility or even queue design. Um, in our third installment, we started getting into the world of engineering, uh, specifically for structural. And we learned how structural engineers, they are working with foundations, they're working with roof trusses, uh, they're working in concrete, they're working in steel uh, to take on some significantly formidable challenges uh, in the theme park industry. And today we are starting to talk about electrical engineering. So I'm very excited because two of my favorite people on the planet are going to be able to present for us. Um, I'm lucky enough to actually get to work with them on a daily basis. And they are Kristen Williams and Matt Shainer from EXP. Um, they're going to tell us everything we need to know about electrical engineering in the theme park industry. So Kristen, take it away. Thank you, Walter. So hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. I'm gonna to give you a little overview about what we're gonna talk about uh, this evening. Uh, I'm gonna start off with some introductions for me and for Matt. Uh, then we're gonna go through the basics of electrical engineer, all the little key things you need to know. Uh, after that, we'll move on to kind of explaining a little more what electrical is in the theme park industry. And we'll move on to uh, the details of what we do every day, kind of our day-to-day -day, um, documents we create. And then finally, uh, we'll continue on with some of the unique challenges of uh, the theme park industry and what that means to electrical design. And we'll wrap up with uh, the tools of the trade, you know, how we do this and how you can do it too. So I'm Kristen Williams. I am an electrical engineer. I have my professional engineering license in electrical engineering. Um, I am originally from Riverside, California. I was born there, moved to Portland, Oregon, then moved to Kansas City, Missouri and uh, ended up going to Kansas State University where I studied architectural engineering. Um, I got my bachelor's and my master's of science there um, and graduated with both in the spring of uh, 2010. Um, and then I started working with EXP in the Orlando office in 2012. Now we're gonna hand it over to Matt to introduce himself. Thanks, Kristen. Matt Shainer with uh, EXP, obviously, on the electrical side of things. Uh, <clears throat> originally grew up in Summerland, British Columbia, and then made it to Northern Wisconsin, where I went to Milwaukee School of Engineering and a uh, very tiny school, not many have heard of, but our football team is still undefeated. Um, got my bachelor's of science in architectural engineering in 2004, which then I packed the U-Haul and moved down to Orlando, Florida and joined for the people that have been around for quite a while on this call, I joined GRGCE which then became GRG, that became XM, which no one could pronounce, and now I am with EXP. So all those 18 years, I have had a couple different business cards that all had only one of two phone numbers that went from the 407 to the 818, and that's when I moved out to the Los Angeles office in 2013. And so now we'll talk about a little bit of the basics. I know this is usually the section of the design review that everyone sort of dozes off in sleep and kind of wonders what we're talking about, but hopefully we'll, you'll find it a little more electrifying and, uh, and uh, hopefully learn a little bit about what we do. 
So this is a very basic power distribution diagram that you can Google on the internet, probably will be the first hit that comes up. And most people are under, understand this. You got your big power plants, smokestacks, uh, transformers, power lines that travel throughout the countryside to hit that little gray box by your house. Um, but as everyone knows, it does more than just hit the little gray box at your house. It hits your office buildings, your schools, you know, and of course, theme parks. And that's what we'll get into a little bit more here. <clears throat> so electricity tends to be something that scares people because they can't see it. And the only way can you feel it is because it's there and uh, it's not pleasant when you, when you touch it. But one easy way to think about it is it can be thought of as a hose of water. You have uh, high pressure, you have low pressure, you have low flow, you have high flow, combination of the two. And the wires are like our pipes, they're different sizes to allow for different um, flows through them based on the different amounts of pressure. So when we get into things, you can really just think of it as water going through pipes, but we just have invisible little electrons going down pieces of copper or aluminum. So uh, I, I know it's shockingly simple, but hopefully it's a, uh, it's a little way to remember how, uh, what we do. And this is very familiar with most TEA members. If you attend uh, events would be our typical uh, well poured glass of beer here. And this is a good way to think of power. So your, your real power is the beer. That's your KW doing most of the work. There is some reactive power, which is the foam on the top. And then the owner gets the bill for the whole thing of beer, which is the apparent power or the KBA. A lot of times we will talk independently between the two, but there's a slight difference that sometimes we care about and sometimes we don't. And more specifically in a theme park, you get mugs of beer that look like this. Um, you can have a launch coaster and you end up with a lot of foam on that power, which is your reactive power. And this is also called imaginary power, but it's not quite the imaginary stuff that all the creative people are thinking of. It is the things that we have to think of um, because this can change your power factor, which then you have to figure out what's gonna happen with my own utility. How is the utility gonna like this? Are they gonna charge me more money for this? So we get into a lot of analysis on how that foam can affect the power system within a theme park. Uh, another item for the basics for us is just terminology. I think every industry likes to use acronyms and in the boring construction world, you probably are used to a lobby and a floor and a basement and a roof and that's about it. We get things like air development, queue, ride boxes, you know, vehicle ride assemblies, you know, a lot of more fun stuff. And we are always throwing around terms like LSS or life support systems, which tend to be more on the animal side, which are sometimes called ALSS. DGM is pretty common for background music. You've got fire alarm control panels. You have your AV system, special effects, and then your limbs and flims, which would be your launch coasters. Uh, you know, and if something's going wrong in your, in your attraction, you have the ESAP button. And then there's even buttons that Kristen really likes to, you know, put on the drawings. And what is that acronym, Kristen? It's the OSIT switch or the OSS. Really, it's the uh, uh, operator safety switch, but uh, lovingly called the OSS. <laughs> so, and then why do you need us? So everyone designs an area development system. That's great. You got a building that looks awesome. The structure's holding it up great. And then you walk into the building and without us, it is going to be literally dark and probably stuffy and probably too warm and just not a pleasant place to be. So you need us to help make sure that the lights are on, the HVAC is cooling or heating, depending where you're at, all the technology works and everything inside of the building um, is just humming along as it should be. And the other reason you also need us is because of, Kristen? Electricity <laughs> is dangerous. <laughs> um, I think you've all seen these signs, you know, they're not just for fun, they mean serious business, you know, danger of death, uh, risk of electrocution, uh, risk of injury, you know, these aren't jokes. Well, maybe some of them are jokes, but uh, this is really at the key of what we do. Um, you know, we have guidelines to keep everybody safe and we want to make sure that all the guests are, and employees are safe um, when they're working and coming to visit the theme parks around our systems. Um, so there's one document that we use more than any other to do this. And this is a National Electrical Code. This is NFPA 70. 
This is our main central document and it is what we go to for sizing conduits, sizing cable, um, sizing circuit breakers. Basically everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis starts with this document, but we follow a lot of other codes as well. So we've got that national electrical code being the main one. Um, some of the other ones that are key to us are the uh, national fire alarm code and signaling code. So uh, we will also do fire alarm designs as part of, um, part of what we do. Um, and so this is one that we follow a lot for placement of uh, pull stations, for placement of those uh, speaker strobes, um, anything that's going to help you get out of a building safely in the event of a fire alarm. Um, some other codes that we follow are the uh, NFPA 1 and NFPA 101, which kind of go hand in hand, uh, fire code and life safety code. Um, these will dictate things like where low exit signs need to be in a, in a special attraction. So if you have an assembly building and people are, are needing to get out and there's a you know, heavy smoke glare, we'll, we'll put those exit signs down at a low level so that people um, can find them in an emergency. And this is one of the codes that dictates that. Um, another um, uh, code that we'll, we'll follow when it's adopted is the NFPA 110. And this is the standard for emergency and standby power systems. Uh, this dictates the design of uh, generator systems, of battery backup systems. Um, it'll dictate, you know, what kind of separations we need in our equipment. So sometimes we'll end up having, you know, more room for our equipment than, um, you know, we someone might want to see. But that's to, to keep everyone safe and to make sure we keep those emergency systems um, where they need to be. <clears throat> Another one that we follow on some of our projects and particularly me here in Florida and doing a lot of uh, design in Florida is a standard for installation of lightning protection systems. So this is NFPA 780, and this will only apply um, where an owner, you know, owner's insurance requires it or a local jurisdiction requires it. Uh, another uh, standard or code we follow is the NESC. This is a national electrical safety code. Um, this dictates more on the, on the maintenance and side of things. So, It'll say how far someone needs to stand to service a piece of equipment. Um, a lot of the rules regarding arc flash are found in this document. And finally, the local building codes. And these are kind of our you know, key thing. Um, it's what we try and become the pros of. Um, many different areas have their own specific code. You know, we do a lot of business in, in California and in Florida. So we've got the CEC, California Electrical Code, the Florida Building Code. And then some you know, local jurisdictions even get more specific. So we've got the Epcot codes um, uh, in the Disney area here in Florida. Um, so on that note, you know, we're trying to account for all of these different things and all the intricacies of all of this. We really try and be your electrical accountants through everything that we do. And that's gonna talk a little bit more about all the systems that we, we account for on a daily basis. That's right. We are the electrical accountants. Everyone always tries to ask, what do you do? And I say, I don't design the ride. I don't design the show. I don't design certain things, but I take all of their inputs and go through them, add them up, comb through all these systems and make sure that when we turn things on, everything works and is safe. Uh, you know, how this applies in the theme park is you're walking through the beautifully designed area development land. You're listening to background music. You might be pulling out your phone, interacting with the prop. You're all doing that while connected on Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, you're just enjoying your time, listening and feeling everything going around you. You're going to walk up to your attraction, and if the wait timer is telling you it's not too long of a line, you're going to go into it. You get background music again there. You get show lighting. You get AV speakers. You have animatronics moving. All of that while you're probably still on your phone on some sort of Wi-Fi or boosted cell phone signal. Um, so. Just by getting into the queue, you've probably made it through a couple of series of our drawings. Um, you know, we have a lot of drawings that we put together and that'll handle all those different systems. And we haven't even made it in, into the pre-show yet. So there's, there's a lot of different things that we have to go through and account for and make sure it's documented, sized properly and safely. So in, in this list that you see on the screen here is just low voltage systems that doesn't include different types of normal power, emergency power, UPS power, isolated power, or a combination of all of those powers above at the top. So there's a lot of little parts and pieces to keep track of uh, as an electrical engineer. Now we're gonna talk a little more specifically about the theme park industry and what electrical is in the theme park industry. So we'll go back to that diagram we showed before. We've got that same power grid that we had, you know, connected to the home, uh, the power traveling from the plant down to the transformers and substations to that theme park. 
Um, but what that theme park is using is going to look a little bit different than what your home use. Um, it may use a different voltage for some of the attractions. Um, it may require a much higher load and definitely requires a much higher load in your house. Um, you know, a typical launch coaster could be the power of your whole neighborhood. Um, so it's um, certainly going to look a little different. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a take a look at what a site-wide electrical loop might look like. So picture a theme park site. Um, you're going to have attractions there. You're going to have maybe a water ride or a theater. Um, also supporting this theme park, you're going to have things like the employee administration buildings. Uh, you're going to have restrooms. Uh, there's going to be a parking lot where everyone's going to come to that's going to need lighting and power. Um, there may even be a hotel on site where you have to get power and data to guests and all, all their needs while staying there. Uh, there are a lot of different components of this site. And what we do when we first begin a project is start to estimate what each of these components might take. So how much load are each of these buildings going to use? And we want to know both the individual loads and we want to know the total load for the whole site. So we can work with the utility to design uh, how much power needs to come to the site and then also to determine where it needs to be placed throughout the site. Uh, so you can, this red line is indicative of the electrical uh, loop around the site. This may be by the utility or it may be um, by, the, um, by the park itself. Um, and then we will uh, design where these transformers or switches will be placed around the site in order to get power to the individual buildings. It could be that a specific transformer is serving just one building, say you've got a large attraction. It could be that that large attraction needs several transformers to serve it. But that's what um, this part of the process is about for us is laying those out. Um, you know, you could have a one transformer that feeds, you know, a restroom building and a theater and a food and beverage uh, location, but it's all about um, getting those loads together, balanced, and um, determining how much we need. These things take a lot of space, so this is why it's important to do the planning uh, at this stage. You're going to have that red line indicative of those large conduits you're seeing on the left there. You know, these may be four inch or larger conduits. They may be concrete encased. Um, they may have a concrete cap on them, but they certainly take up uh, a, a good amount of space. Uh, another thing that uh, we're planning for is the um, switch gear that supports it. So that top right photo, you may have a room of switch gear, or you may have a yard outside with the switch gear located. And then uh, utility transformers, the, the green boxes that um, everyone wants to kind of go away and hide, but um, these are, you know, generally fairly large and um, require a large clearance in front of them, generally about 10 feet. So um, it's important when planning the site to know where these are going to be. And then talking about clearance, moving down into the building level, uh, looking at just the typical electrical room, um, you'll see that the panels and equipment themselves take up a fair amount of space, but it's really this orange clearance that dictates you know, the size of this room. Um, the large piece of switch gear in the room has an eight foot clearance in this, in this case, and um, you know, leads to needing a fair amount of depth in the room. Um, the other thing is that there are many systems within a single room. So we've got some emergency feeds, we've got um, some normal feeds, which would just be your general receptacles, you know, general power, maybe some show loads. Um, you may have a transformer that uh, is for isolated power or clean power that serves, uh, say, your AV loads. Um, but there are a lot of different components within these electrical rooms. And while the conduits aren't as large as what we saw um, out on the site, if you look at that picture on the right, there are going to be a lot of them. So we're going to have all of those branch conduits or the conduits going out to the individual um, loads in the building um, coming back in and taking up a fair amount of space. And the other thing uh, that really adds to a lot of space are all these systems that we were talking about. Um, so not only does it take up a lot of physical space uh, on the site, but it also takes up a lot of plan sheets. Um, you know, we are often one of the largest sets in a package uh, on an attraction. So on a recent attraction, we had, um, you know, 100 sheets for the mechanical set, uh, still a really big package for a mechanical package. Um, architectural topping out at 373 and electrical coming in at 555. So that's, you know, all of these systems, all that power we talked about um, coming together in, in one package. All that information doesn't come just from the minds of us, the electrical engineers. We work with a lot of really cool people um, that help 
bring this complicated design together. So if you look in black here, you'll see kind of the traditional team members that uh, we're used to working with, uh, structural engineers, landscape architects, uh, civil engineers. Um, but these people in blue are the ones that kind of bring this special stuff to the theme park industry and that will uh, help um, help us uh, bring this all together and you know develop these design doc documents and give us the inputs to do that. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about the team members, I think Matt's going to talk a little bit more about those documents that we do produce, be it plans or models um, in the design process of what we do. And what we do is going to be documentation, lots of documentation. So ultimately, there's many different types of documentation we do. The first and foremost thing that we want to do is get a 2D set of of PDFs or back in the old days, hard copies of actual drawings that go to your favorite AHJ that is going to review the drawings and approve them with no comment and everything goes smoothly. Um, but ultimately we do also do a lot of BIM modeling and BIM coordination. And even though they are kind of the same, they are also different. So we need to go figure out how to put all of these things into a model, into a, um, into a, different set of systems so we can output and coordinate with everybody. An example of what we might do is a one line diagram like we have here. And this shows basically um, the, the, how all those green boxes that Kristen talked about are, are connected up. So we'll have to go through and look at the loads of all the buildings, determine how many of them there are, how big they are, because some attractions may have one to four different services to them depending on how much power they need. You know, if you think about your average office building, it might have a transformer that's 300 kVA, might handle most of it. We might have like a pair of 2,500 kVAs and maybe a thousand just for, uh, you know, the facility on the side. So that can be just one attraction with, you know, possibly four big green boxes outside. So we will go through, document all this stuff and, you know, we'll have the, the big green boxes, like I was saying, the beautiful manholes and pull boxes that everyone loves to see in the paving. Well, actually, no, they don't. But we try to hide those as well and make sure that they're still accessible for safe, uh, safe access, but also doesn't in infringe on the guest experience. Going back to Kristen's slide here about the utility loop, that's where a lot of our design starts. And we you know, start at that level and determine where all those boxes are. And then we will work into the building, taking all of the loads from all the different people, doing our electrical accounting magic, negotiating room sizes within buildings, um, and also then trying to figure out how to make the room sizes that we have work for all of the items that we have. And as Kristen mentioned, you know, we sometimes if you only have one door, you need double the distance for things. So there's a lot of things we have to take into account with the different shapes and geometries of, of buildings that we get because uh, you know, a nice square rectangular building is really easy to design. <laughs> the stuff that we get tends to be a lot of a challenge and not only is there the electrical side of it, we do have a lot of the physical constraints that we have to work with as well. But we're engineers, we like Legos, we like building blocks. So it's kind of a fun thing to you know, have to come in and do. And then we get to connect all those building blocks with a lot of lines and, and know someone's uh, Someone's uh, toddler son did not scribble all over this drawing here. Um, this is actually an engineering drawing, and this is showing how different devices are being connected from point to point. So you might have lighting control, you're gonna have different special effects systems, you're gonna have power, you're gonna have many different systems that are all having to crisscross um, around each other. So we, we do our design drawings, and then on the next slide, you'll see where a contractor will come in and then create shop drawings that's probably a little more organized how they want to run theirs in common trenches and whatnot that we will review. And all of that still has to coordinate with the structural engineer's footing. Sometimes we have to go under them, over them, through them, and then we have to coordinate with them on how we can make that work. A lot of people may think that a building is supported solely by soil and a structural system, but um, in a theme park, it's a huge layer of PVC conduit in there. So uh, this is a little isometric here. 
You can see on the right side of the drawing, you've got your green boxes with the large feeders that will come from there into your distribution system. And then things just spider out across the building, hitting all of those different systems that we showed you before, whether it was power systems or the low voltage systems. But you know, there's when it's all said and done, probably like 100 different systems that you could be having to run a conduit for. And then all of that ends up in the field looking stuff like this. And these are probably some of the cleaner things that I've seen before. Um, there's some other attractions I've worked on where we have had just layers and layers of conduits because there just was so much technology in those buildings. So we get to help work with the contractors to make sure they have stuff accounted for and, and everything will work out in the field when we are done with uh, construction and they're into all their testing. And that leads us to a lot of unique challenges that Kristen will take us through. Yep. Matt started to touch on this a little bit, but we, we certainly work with some unique buildings. Um, they're usually um, not usually shaped. So they are um, you know, rectangular maybe for the ride box portion, um, but then they'll have a you know, strange queue or a gift shop area that comes off of it in a weird way. Um, so these buildings are not normal. Um, and the things that are inside them are not, not your standard, uh, standard building. So um, the ride here, we need to make sure to get power and data to many locations along it. Um, we'll have to hit a lot of these columns here um, with conduit or with grounding. Um, and we need to make sure that we're working around the clearance of that ride so as not to put any of our components within its envelope. The other thing we need to both power and work around are show systems, you know, Rock work, uh, screens, you're not even seeing all you know, the projection and um, many you know, special effects that might be in around it here. Um, and then you get the facility components coming in on top of that. You know, we have you know, our switchboard again to serve the building. We've got motor control controllers to serve the ride. Uh, we've got this telecom room supporting the whole thing. So we need to fit in and around all of those components, those ride and show components within that framework of the building and make sure that we are supporting that system the best we can. Um, I've talked a little bit about some of the systems in the building. I'm going to move up to the roof for a minute. Talk a bit about lightning protection. Um, as I said, in Florida, we do a fair bit of lightning protection design. Um, the picture you're looking at here would be for a, a normal building, not one that's unique. So a square uh, prescriptive method we have down in this bottom right corner. Those are air terminals or Franklin rods, um, lightning rods as uh, they might be called. And this is what we would do for um, kind of a, a regularly shaped structure. But when we get into themed entertainment, we might encounter something more like this, um, where we're wanting to try and limit uh, the number of air terminals that you see on the building. So we'll use uh, a rolling sphere method uh, to determine where we could eliminate some of those air terminals. And we may even use some of the metal components of the building to act as an air terminal if they're of a sufficient diameter. So in this case, um, wherever this 150 foot radius sphere um, touches, everything below it is uh, protected as long as it's not touching the building itself. So if it's touching those uh, lightning protection components, they would be protected underneath it. And this would be using, again, those traditional Franklin rod um, lightning rods, air terminals. Um, there's another type of system um, that we uh, have used on UnProjects recently. And there's a little bit of debate in the engineering community about this one, um, but it's the early streamer emission system. And basically um, this system propagates a little upward leader um, from the top of it into, um, into the air when there's a storm. And so that allows the lightning to kind of target in that location uh, during a storm. And it allows for a larger cone of protection uh, around the building. But what it does require is that that uh, device is up pretty high above the roof of the building. So that may be anywhere from 15 to 25 feet. Uh, so you may need to uh, theme that out in the themed entertainment industry as you know, an antenna, as a flagpole. Uh, we've done a lot of different things to, to hide these. And they are starting to look a little less space agey than the, than the one on the right there. Um, so you may get a layout, something like this. You, know, you have a uh, one device on the building here and maybe another one uh, to support this area over here and your radius of protection may extend all the way out um, into the area development and those smaller structures that are around it there. Um, so you, you've got to coordinate with, you know, the building structural to mount that up on the roof. You've got to coordinate with your 
um, show designers and um, architects on the appearance of that device up on your roof um, that people could be seeing um, from the um, from the area development. So it's really um, everything we do in effort and in a lot of coordination. And Matt is going to talk a little bit more about all of that. And that is right. We coordinate and we re-coordinate and we get even more coordination and we work with all these different people and and what you might find out is there's ripple effects. Someone changes something on the ride control system that would directly change something else, somebody else's system, which will eventually cause a change in our, our documents. So there are a lot of different items that we need to coordinate and through all that, that all goes together and then produces electrical drawings. Um, I, I have to say we're, we probably might interact the most with the different disciplines other than maybe the architecture because they have the walls, floors, and ceilings that everything touches, but we might be number two with how many things that our systems will actually touch. So we just have to make sure everything works, and especially in a theme park. We want to make sure you don't see our stuff, but it's it it you know is either hidden in a wall or we can do it in a way that's you know behind a guest view or just is uh, works out better with the theming to make a better guest experience. And a lot of this is a lot like herding kittens, but I mean, who doesn't like Westerns and cute little fluffy kittens, but it's, uh, it's what makes our job fun, interesting and keeps us coming in every day. Uh, you know, like this is an example of a, of a launch coaster or a launch system on a coaster. You're gonna have a lot of different stub up points with conduits that will bring a ton of electrical cables up. There's gonna be temperature sensors on the, on the uh, on the limbs of the slims and then you're going to have speed sensors and you know compressed air for block brakes if it's going too fast you know there's a lot of different things that we need to look at and coordinate and figure out how do we get from point a to point b and it just is uh like like we said before a lot of electrical accounting and then even with these systems you have separation requirements between the systems the launch coasters sometimes can be anywhere from 400 volts, which is more of a European voltage than our 4, 480 volt, but it can be six, um, 600, 690. You know, we get a lot of different things that we have to work with. And then there's space require or separation requirements from the low voltage system, just so you don't have electrical noise or magnetic fields inter interfering with uh, other low voltage signals. And uh, so, how do we get all this done? Um, first and foremost, Revit is probably our biggest tool of the trade. Uh, it is a five letter word spelled with four words, four letters, but it is a very, very powerful tool that we can put everything in from aesthetics, which is what a lot of people like in Revit is you can see what that light fixture looks like or where it is in the wall. You can see the outlet, but then on the engineering side, we can keep track of our electrical loads we can keep track of all of our panels. We can really just kind of keep a whole project within a Revit model and know everything about it electrically as it, as it relates to the physical world and the engineering side of the world. And, and Revit will actually then export into Navisworks and that's kind of the big collection for everyone to see the really cool creative stuff, how our stuff interfaces with it to make sure our stuff needs to be moved or is it not visible. So we use a lot of Navis works just to have checks to make sure things look good. And that sort of ties into the BIM 360 world, which if people have used it, it's another Autodesk product, but you can use this from early on design and especially lately in the construction world where you can do RFIs and submittals and management, change management. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool that, um, that we do a lot with. And one of the most important things is Bluebeam. Did, did I mention Bluebeam yet? Because Bluebeam is just a great program. And if we didn't have to model things in 3D, we could probably almost do our entire life in Bluebeam. So um, that is a very good program to, to be familiar with and something that we'd actually end up doing a lot of work with. Um, and as we get into design, we will reach out to individual manufacturers and we can talk through like generator sizing tools with Caterpillar, Kohler, Generac, Cummins, you know, whoever those people are for their systems. And good and trusty engineers uh, software is Excel. Um, know it, know how to use it well, and it's a great pro uh, pro uh, product to have. So Excel, SKM Power Tools, and AGI for lighting. 
And, you know, a lot of attractions, as big as complicated as they are, they may start with a little spreadsheet here that goes through how much load we know needs to apply to it based on square footage, how like we might say dark ride light, dark ride heavy, launch coaster light, launch coaster heavy, combination of all of them. And with our 30 years of background in all of these different projects, we can go through and take a look at what our, our loads ended up being on these different jobs. And we can use Excel to help pull all that together and get a really good idea of what the load is on a building way back at schematics. And sometimes you can even, you know, get a napkin sketch, napkin sketch from an architect, do a quick load calc in a spreadsheet, and you know, things don't change a whole lot from there. It's uh, you know, usually we get a pretty good, pretty good uh, result out of this. Although I will say this is part magic and part uh, engineering gut. So it's, it is a, it's a good tool to use and to figure out for how things work. And, you know, the SKM side of things, you know, there's a few other programs we can use, but SKM is one of the most comprehensive ones that will go into power analysis. So as Kristen said, we want everything to be safe. So a lot of it may get down to really, really exciting things like these breaker curves that we go through. But these are, are here as a, as a safety item to make sure that a receptacle out in air development doesn't trip out a 3000 amp main inside of an attraction building. So we look at things like how our breakers coordinate with each other. We look at um, short circuit analysis through there. So if there's a fault on the utility side, a squirrel gets into one of the big green boxes, which has happened before. It likes to somehow touch both conductors and um, set off a chain reaction of events. Uh, a fault will go through the building. And you need to make sure that when that fault goes through the building that the equipment is not destroyed and hurt anybody during that event. It doesn't necessarily have to work when it's done, but it needs to be designed so that it doesn't uh, separate from itself during that incident. And in that same manner, this program also does arc flash studies, which are really important on the maintenance side, like Kristen said with the NC, NECS, or the National Electrical Safety Code, I believe it was. But that will be the arc flash study that tells somebody, can I go work on this with a cotton shirt on and cotton gloves, or do I need to wear the full spacesuit and stand 10 feet away from it and everything in between? So this, this is a very powerful program that you can really get into some of the weeds of how the electricity flows through the buildings. And on a little bit more of a lighter side, we have our lighting calculation tool. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that the egress pathways, you know, in and out of the building are adequately lit per code. Is the parking lot have enough light into it? You know, so there's a lot of things we need to look into because especially in theme parks, you have a lot of twisty turning maze-like areas that are designed to help make you lose your illusion of where you're at, but in an emergency, we need to make sure that you have enough light that you can, you know, find your way out of the attraction. So we will use things like AGI or Loom tools and and just and a couple of different software programs that you can actually go in and it'll tell you how much light you will have based on the light fixtures you select. So Thank you, Matt. toss over to Kristen <laughs> to wrap us up a little bit here. Yep. Well, thanks everybody. We were you know happy to introduce ourselves to you and. Uh, give you a little bit of the basics of what electrical engineering is and tell you a little bit more about what electrical engineering is in the theme park industry. Um, we shared a bit about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, the documentation we produce, and we talked about some of the unique challenges that um, you face as an electrical engineer in the theme park industry. And then finally, let you know our favorite programs and the things you want to know how to do if you want to do this too. And so if you do want to become a theme park electrical engineer, uh, there are several pathways to become um, to get into this industry. Um, Matt and I both have an architectural engineering degree. Uh, we work with a lot of people with uh, electrical engineering degrees. Um, it's really, you know, different uh, universities have different types of programs. Uh, you know, when you do architectural engineering, you can kind of focus in on electrical. Um, many people also start with like a technical college or a CAD modeling background. And um, while you won't be able to sign and seal drawings necessarily, if you go that pathway, 
you know, you certainly can end up doing everything, you know, that, um, that Matt and I do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, if you want to get into this industry, an internship, great way to start, um, be it in an engineering, um, you know, engineering company or in a themed entertainment company, you know, getting um, familiar with the facilities and the types of things you're doing, that, that helps as well. Um, definitely, it's a, you know, everybody makes their own path into this industry. I certainly thought I was going to be a structural engineer when I started out in college. You know, day one, I was all in on being structural, went to my statics class, not for me. Um, so I brought my uh, uh, theme park nerddom and uh, a love for uh, my math classes together and ended up going this route a little bit more. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And I think Walter's got some questions lined up, maybe, and we'll be happy to answer them any we have. Uh, excellent. Good job, guys. Very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a handful of questions here, so I'm going to pick and choose some of them and direct them your way. Uh, this one I'm going to send to you, Kristen. Uh, it's actually a two-parter. Uh, yeah. First one, or the first part of it is, of all the, the higher voltage systems that you deal with, um, what would you say, which system would you say is the, the hardest or the most difficult to learn? And then do you have any tips on how to learn about them? Um, so I haven't done a whole lot of high, high voltage, but I would say um, that one of the higher voltage systems we work with is Matt touched on our launch coasters. And they are those strange, you know, not your standard building voltages. So, um, you know, it may be that 690 voltage and, you know, it could be 690 um, line to line and then line to neutral, maybe 400. Um, so it's really, um, you know, when we get into it, we have to get really deep into the diagrams that they send us. And it's, you know, having conversations with the ride vendor. Um, so to learn a little more about that, you know, I would look into, um, you know, ride vendor information. I think that is a great place, you know, looking at that Intamin, that, at Tacoma, um, all those companies and kind of seeing what they do. And even if you go to their website, you can learn a little more about the, the limbs and the slims that um, Matt was talking about. And that can kind of get you into that um, you know, knowing a little bit more about it, but we, really when you get into designing those systems as you, know, you got to talk to them, you got to make sure you're getting on the phone um, with the representative and with the utility company. So. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Matt, do you have anything to add from a 5 kV, 12 kV standpoint? Yeah, I'd say like, like two different things that are always like something to look into is, um, you know, like on those launch coasters, it's a large load. It's kind of like when your AC turns on at home and your lights dim. So you need to start looking into the system and and understanding how that's going to impact your building. So I think, you know, the, to learn that, I think it's just understanding more and more of electrical concepts and then just thinking about applying them on a bigger level. And the medium voltage stuff. So so it's kind of funny how it cracks me up as an electrical engineer is all the signs that say high voltage and it's really not high voltage, but medium voltage is a, a you know usually above 2000 volts. There's a little gray area with that, but up to about what 35K, 34K and then 35 and higher, I think is high voltage. But um, those you just need to kind of know what your load profiles are and understand what loads you're connecting to it because like a lot of this stuff is cut and dry about the size of the pipes that I was talking about earlier is how big they are based on your voltage but there there is overcurrent protection that happens to them and I will say the more I've, I've dug into that to research it for different projects the more it's a little bit like a uh, engineer's like voodoo call on on how they size some of that based on what the loads that are connecting to it. And, and obviously our stuff is very unique. So you just have to kind of use an engineering judgment on it, but just understanding how all that works and then just learning how to apply it is kind of the biggest thing. Cool. Okay, uh, the next one is gonna come your way, Matt. And it's gonna be in reference to your awesome beer uh, analogy <laughs> that deals with reactive power. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what generates reactive power? So reactive power is kind of a push back and forth when voltage and current are out of phase on, on the systems. And really that comes in on our launch coasters because it is a huge, huge, huge inductive load that happens instantly. So there's just a lot of, you know, you know, you kind of think of like things trying to rush off and, you know, things not catching up right away. It just creates a little bit of an imbalance and, and those are the projects that we usually have the, the biggest problem with. 
Um, some utilities, we've, we always have to talk to the utility to say, hey, do you guys care if we have a bad power factor? You know, too much foam on the system. Some utilities don't care and some of them are more sensitive. So sometimes we will have to put something in to compensate for it. Um, it's becoming a little bit less common, but attractions that were older with a lot of motor loads that had a, had a higher inductive load, we would put a capacitor bank out back and there's another green box that you put out in the back to help counteract when that would happen. Okay, so not as much of a problem these days unless you have very specific uh, um, ride systems, right? Yeah, it's just something to be cognizant of. You know, it's uh, you have to size your system possibly bigger than what people might think you need to size, but you have to account for it. Got it. Okay. Uh, next question is for you, Kristen. I like this question a lot because nobody's ever asked me this. Um, what are some of the things uh, the creative team can do to help make the engineers or the electrical engineers job easier, like during concept Ooh. design? Ooh. Um, it's, you know, when we get uh, spreadsheet inputs are always great. I know we don't always have an idea, but even if we don't know um, what the elements are yet, you know, if it's, I think I'm going to have five of, you know, this thing, maybe I don't even have a great idea, but just trying uh, to kind of quantify amounts of um, effects and um, amounts of items you're going to have. Um, I've seen a project where someone just went through and did kind of spots on, and dots on paper early on. You know, they really didn't know what the things were, but you know, we think we have a few show elements over here. And sharing that with the team, we don't always get to see some of the early conceptual stuff. We'll, um, we'll see the plan drawings, but we're not always privy to all the neat, you know, cool uh, uh, creative planning that's happening. So um, any of that, just basic, you know, simplifying it down to, you know, I've got a few of these, I've got a few of that um, is great. And then um, when we've done walkthroughs, you know, in the model together, that's always helpful as well. So um, sometimes I won't know that that, you know, really awesome wall you've planned to be this beautiful mural is a beautiful mural. So us taking the time to, um, spend, you know, an hour to walk through a plan together to talk about what's really important, where you don't want to see uh, the fire alarm devices that we're going to place, where you don't want to see, you know, the facility lights, um, taking the time um, early on to talk through what areas are important and kind of, yeah, quantifying what, what we think might be out there, I would say is the, the big things starting out. Good point. Uh, Matt, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I think one thing that, uh, you know, always is a little bit hard for us to coordinate is um, you can have a lot of attractions and our electrical rooms get pushed out of the way a lot of times to the back. But just thinking about all these systems, like the more high tech of an attraction you have, so like having some electrical rooms scattered throughout the facility, because once we have to start going long distances, we either need to change cables, which costs more, um, but having more localized um, electrical rooms uh, on the higher tech attractions help a lot. And I think a lot of times getting in those, those in sooner help before a, a creative design is cooked and then someone says, well, wait, how do I put an extra room in there? So, you know, the, um, you know, basic attractions is probably not as important, but sometimes, you know, as you saw with all those conduits that we have, those all have to go somewhere. So the longer they are, the harder it is for things to work out. Yeah, centralized, a few centralized locations that are hidden from view can end up being a lot better than <laughs> at the end of a project, you know, uh, scrambling and trying to add boxes out, you know, out that are visible or, you know, conduit pathways that are um, visible. So that pre-planning for the centralized locations is really helpful. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, a lot of times we won't actually get involved in the project until later on in like schematic design or design development, God forbid. Um, getting us involved earlier in the process so we can give you those types of space requirements ahead of time uh, helps a lot too, because it's always harder to carve out space uh, the longer you get into the design process. Um, and I'm always amazed at how quickly your rooms uh, uh, fill up with stuff. You know? <laughs> like you know, a launch coaster. Just give us a 45 foot room that's 16 feet wide. We will fill it up. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just blows my mind to, to how much space your equipment really does take. So yeah. great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, Kristen, this one's going to be for you. Um, 
do we have any examples of, uh, of, of how you've accommodated changes in the electrical requirements for an attraction or facility that have been made after conduit has been laid and facility construction is completed? Woo. <laughs> yeah. Patience and spares. <laughs> so uh, spares are really important to us. I think we were just talking about sizing an electrical room. But I will always, when I lay out my electrical room, I'll um, tend to leave a little space between equipment or make my equipment a little larger than it needs to be to start off. That's my secret. Sorry, I'm sharing it. But because um, we will feel that we'll end up having more equipment come in. It inevitably happens every time. And I, you know, I know we want to be as lean as we can and, uh, you know, make sure we're not taking up more space than we need to. But especially on the electrical side, we're going to get more, you know, show, show elements added, you know, there's going to be another system that we need to accommodate um, something, a new technology that comes in later in the design that we just didn't know about when we started the design. So um, for me, it's always giving a little bit of extra room in those equipment rooms and then um, designing uh, for spare conduits where we can. So, um, you know, giving yourself some percentage of spare, you know, empty conduits going from point to point, you still can't plan for everything. I know we've had projects in a large ride box where we've done, you know, a whole bunch of underground conduit and then we bring the ride in and oh, all of a sudden we need to get one spot out, out in the middle of the ride. So, you know, you get a little creative with, um, you know, using a ride trench, uh, going along fencing, things like that, like looking at what route isn't visible, what um, route can get you there, but um, always uh, letting us have a few spares in our system and not, you know, being that out, I think is really important. It can save a, a lot in the end. That's a really good point, especially when you consider the fact that a lot of times we don't get final ride inputs until well after we're under construction. Um, so people think, well, you know, just coordinate during design, but those inputs aren't either they're not available or they, they change as time goes on. So um, definitely the spare conduit thing. And I would suggest getting uh, an electrical engineer that has done these types of systems before um, based on all the experience we have, we kind of know, you know, where conduits need to go. And, and we can even ask the question, well, wait a minute, you know, the last time we did a ride like this, uh, we needed to put conduit between here and here, is that something that we need to do on, on this attraction? So having an experienced electrical engineer will help avoid that to begin with. Um, so let's see here. The next question is for you, Matt. Um, let's see. The, the comment is that uh, the creative component of theme park construction makes the design subject to continuous changes. How can you uh, actively designed to anticipate for the expected evolution of those inputs? Uh, I, I mean, we're always are expecting inputs to change. Uh, you know, one thing we try to do, you always try to, like Kristen said, be as lean as possible on your design because dollars matter. But one thing that we always do is, you know, if, if you're pulling cables out somewhere and we just know that it's an area that's subject to change uh, on a routine basis, like, hey, this type of thing, you know, if, if you can get away with a one inch conduit, maybe we put a one and a half, you know, or put a spare in as Kristen would say, because we, we know things will always change. And, and as Walter was saying too, there's sometimes we'll get inputs and they look a little light, but we have to produce documents early. So we will just know, hey, on our past like five jobs, they needed this type of system and we haven't seen anything for it. And last project we needed three two inch conduits. So let's just run them to the corner and at least we can get into the space. And then once we actually get those inputs that we can reroute it. So it's, it's just kind of knowing what's gonna come and building in some spare capacity. And I think another thing that we've done is things are always changing in our, in our projects and being flexible. You know, I think a, a lot of engineers in probably more traditional buildings are just like, this is how it has to be done. And we won't deviate from it, but we've kind of learned well, Maybe this isn't our first option, but you know this attraction needs to work. What is a good code compliant safe method that we get from point A to point B that's different than what you'd normally do? You know, like we get some creative installation discussions and coming up with details uh, to make all that stuff work. Cool. Okay, uh, next question is for you, Kristen. Uh, how did you get your bachelor's and master's degree at the same time? Uh, so at Kansas State, they have a combined program where it's a five-year program for architectural engineering. 
uh, to get your bachelor's and um, you can basically add on either it was either a semester or a year. Um, I did the year option because I was working through it as well um, to, to basically add on that master's and they they combine them and you get them at the same time there. So you can kind of mix and match the classes a little bit over the last year or so of your of your project. So if you hadn't, you know, you start some of your master's classes a little bit early, but um, I think I I don't know that I ever walked through my bachelor's actually. I just went to the master's ceremony because they were at the same time. So I cut down some of that time <laughs> sitting in the graduation <laughs> room, but yep. Very and I think some of the other, um, other architectural engineering schools do that. I don't know if they still do, but um, well, you know, Penn State does that as well where you went? Yeah, yeah they still do. Uh, and again, it takes extra work because uh, you got to take some extra classes uh, when, you're, when your friends are only taking maybe four or five classes, you might have to take five or six. Uh, so it is extra effort to get them at the same time. Um, but you know, that's the most efficient way to do it. Um, I will say this, that uh, I'm not sure if getting a master's is a requirement like it is in other okay. engineering degrees. Um, the, the best, best way you can get an education in this industry is actually through experience, uh, is just doing it and honestly making mistakes along the way. You learn more from your mistakes than you make from, or that you learn from your successes. So, um, and me getting my master's actually to that point was more of a, uh, function of location for me at the time I was working and my husband was working there. So I was I was still out at school. So I'm like, now's the time to do this. And I did it. I'm glad I had it because at the time it um, reduced the amount of time it took for me to get my PE, um, my engineering license, um, that experience counted towards it. But yeah, I certainly on a day to day basis that that work experience I was getting during that time was probably the best, uh, the best thing I had. Very good. Uh, Matt, this one's for you. Is there anything that you wished you knew before entering the industry? Hmm. Probably how to be more successful in day trading. No, um, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like our industry has been really good. You know, we came out of AE programs, so we kind of knew a lot about um, how construction goes together. So I think if you have a more of a construction based background, um, you know, I think that helps. But maybe if you don't understand how buildings come together and it's not quite the degree like that. Um, just maybe learning a little bit more about how different trades work. Um, I actually had an internship that was with a contractor before I did all my engineering stuff while I was at engineering school. But, you know, you know, you learn about what goes into the building, but actually seeing how it's built, I think is great. So I don't, I don't know if there's anything I would probably want to know different coming into it. Cause every, like, you know, the company taught me everything I needed to know. And you just kind of learn on all these projects as you go, but. Um, okay. I would say just having a good understanding of how things go together is super helpful in our industry, just to see the construction side of things too. So tagging on to that, um, what advice would you give like a high school senior who's considering getting into architectural engineering? Um, I would say, you know, the programs that we kind of walked through, you know, playing around with those, you know, taking internships. And, you know, like I did a construction internship, which was awesome. I did it for one summer, but just being out in the field, seeing how things come together, it just really helps you when you are sitting down and designing stuff, um, you know, for many different reasons. A, you're not outside all day when it's 95 degrees and 100% humidity. You appreciate a job, job in the office sometimes. But um, I just think just kind of understanding more of what's going around and playing around with those different softwares and, um, you know, just, you know, being open to maybe an internship that you didn't initially think you'd want to do, but it's just a good way to understand more about how the field works. And I would piggyback on that and say, uh, public speaking and talking to people more than you would. So um, we are not an engineering discipline that we sit in our cubicle, put our head down, do our job and, and sit all day. Uh, we are constantly communicating with people. We're constantly presenting designs, especially I feel like in the theme park industry, even more than um, some of the other industries, uh, electrical engineering and building design is all about you know talking with others, uh, communicating constantly. So um, for someone who may have been a little shy coming into all this, um, that is something maybe I uh, would have you know loved to know more, but it's, I've enjoyed it. So um, just make sure that you you know work on those skills too. 
So. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the best engineering programs to come through when you want to do stuff like this because it's like all those people that we had on the screen, like we literally have to talk to all those people all the time. So you get to know these people, they become your friends and it makes working just a lot better. You're not just, you know, cranking out Walmarts, you know, doing the same thing, talking to the same four people your whole career. It's, you know, like it's like the TA, it's a huge network of people that are just, you know, really good and that can be your job. So. And that's a great point because a lot of the things we do aren't necessarily just in the office, right? I mean, Kristen, you spent a lot of time in the field. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit more about your experience and some of the uh, the larger dark rides um, and, and how challenging it is in the field? Yeah, so when we get into some of our yeah larger attractions um, and construction, that can be, a, you know, nearly full-time, this full-time job for an electrical engineer out there. So it'll be, you know, a large portion of what we do um, going out, you know, we'll go and survey, you know, conduits in the field, make sure that what's installed is, you know, what we plan for. We'll go and, um, you know, review devices that have been installed, um, kind of those basic things, but we'll also uh, participate in a lot of the um, planning and testing that happens for the safety systems. So, um, a lot of what we do at the end of construction is making sure that, um, you know, when the emergency power system is called for, when the generator system is called for, it comes on, it brings on all the lights it needs to, um, you know, that when um, the fire alarm system goes off, the right sequence of things happen. So, um, you know, it may be that in our attraction, when a fire alarm goes off, that we are, you know, muting all the audio everywhere. It may be that we're muting it in a portion of the building and letting the people ride, um, you know, feel like there's nothing going on, finish that ride and then and mute it after that. So there's a lot of different scenarios that happen um, in a ride when an emergency happens. And our goal is to kind of make that seamless to the guest side, but it takes a lot of time and planning, um, getting all those different systems integrated um, in a detailed way to respond to you know, a power outage, a fire alarm. Um, and those are some of the most critical things that we want to assure. Sure, we want to make sure that that receptacle is in, you know, in the right spot or that we've got the power to, you know, this piece of equipment here. But our biggest thing is, you know, on the safety side um, and, and making sure that, you know, we've got the light levels we need in the space and, and that kind of thing. So. And it's not all work, right? We do get to have a little bit of fun <laughs> out there riding rides before the general public can. Sometimes we do get to ride an attraction. <laughs> so at the end, some of the best parts. But <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Well, I think that does it. Um, before everybody drops off, I do have a housekeeping item. This session has been recorded. So uh, we are going to be putting it out on the TEA's YouTube channel. Uh, so tell your friends and family to check it out when it's available. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. So thank you both very, very much for your insight in the industry and sharing all your experience. Um, I know I enjoyed it, and I'm certain everybody else did too. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us today. Thank you. Thanks for joining, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.